Hey guys, so the reason I'm making this video is I've got a lot of friends who I think are quite misguided in the way they're thinking about Bitcoin. It's quite a confusing space for a newcomer, so I've actually just created a quick little presentation here just to step you through what I think are the key things a new person into this space should be looking at. And I'm approaching this from what's called a Bitcoin maximalist view, so I'll get into a little bit more detail on that. So, yeah, I guess let's just sort of talk through some of the confusing times in, in the crypto land right now. So you got a lot of people out there who are trying to sell you blockchain technology and use cases and this, that and the other technology. And then you've got other people who are trying to sell you an initial coin offering as opposed to an, an initial public offering for shares. Or even worse, you've got people who are basically doing shitcoin forks off of Bitcoin, such as Bitcoin Cash, Bcash, or the recently failed Segwit 2x uh, fork attempt. So these are all totally confusing for a newcomer. And I'm going to try and just give a quick outline on these and what how you should think about them. So what is Bitcoin maximalism? Bitcoin maximalism is the idea that Bitcoin is going to someday become the dominant money of the world, the global reserve currency and a global unit of account. It may not account for 100% of the kind of money that we use, but it might be you know, 80%. And the idea is that it's a stronger money and therefore it will outcompete other forms of money. Uh, and so I've just included here a little table, uh, which kind of gives you a bit of a comparison between Bitcoin versus say the US dollar, or precious metals. So the important thing that you've got to focus on here is sound money. That's the most important thing in my in my view. It's easy to jump into the technology and I think some people get distracted down random other rabbit holes and other pathways when really the most important thing is to understand the economic and the social factors at play here. And in this case, the most relevant factors are the monetary policy, as in how scarce is this Bitcoin and what is the rate at which it will be inflated or what is the rate at which new supply of Bitcoin will come onto the market. A very closely related and obviously similar thing here is digital scarcity. That's what we believe Bitcoin represents. In a world where if you throw enough human resources at things, you can create more of them. Bitcoin is a little bit different. Its supply is very strictly limited and the schedule on which more are being released is known ahead of time, 100 years ahead of time. And that's a really important factor. So we'll get into that a little bit more in a future slide. And then the other key thing here is censorship resistance and decentralization. It's not centrally controlled by anybody and therefore it can't be easily inflated it can't be easily changed. The, that, that provides you a more credible commitment and a more safe feeling of storing value within Bitcoin. And these are all things that are really, really important for a sound money. It's difficult to have a good sound money if, the, if you're expected to hold your money or hold your value within this good but actually that good could get confiscated or the value of it could be controlled through a fiat diktat by a government or by somebody else who controls the protocol. So when we're talking about monetary policy, this is one of the key slides um, that you should think about and one of the key graphs that you should look at. As you can see here, Bitcoin started on the 3rd of January, 2009. And the, if you look at this uh, money supply blue line, it basically shows you that at the start there was a very high inflation rate because that was just the way to get the money out to, the, out to people who ever wanted it. But as you can see, every four years you've got a halving, which means the new supply rate is halved. And as you can see here, at around 2021, that's when the rate will really kind of drop below what the rate of inflation of gold is and even of and obviously of most of the US dollar and Australian dollar and whatever other fiat money that you have. 
while at the same time this thing is being kept really really scarce so as you can see here the the key thing here is it's a credible commitment to a set total money supply this kind of scarcity we've never had this before and the other interesting thing is and you'll find this as you research more into bitcoin bitcoin supply is so scarce it's even more scarce than gold with gold if everyone were to buy it the price would go up and then what would that do that would incentivize new gold miners to go and find a way to mine gold in a way that previously was not economically sustainable or economically profitable but with bitcoin there is no supply response because if even if more people dedicated hashing power to mining to try and mine more bitcoins faster bitcoin has this thing called a difficulty readjustment and within about two weeks that difficulty would readjust and then we would be back to this same or just very similar to this same total money supply curve. So that's a really credible commitment there that you can believe and other people can believe. And money is in, in a way it's a social sort of phenomena. And so I think most people are not looking at Bitcoin from the right frame of view. They've got to look at it from that Austrian Mengurian understanding of money and money is rela money as related to saleability of an asset through time and space. So you have to think when I'm buying this asset, how well will it hold its value over time? So the Bitcoin maximalist argument is that actually Bitcoin is the best way to buy the future. And so if you want to hold your value for decades into the future, well, Bitcoin is one of the best ways to do that. And so um, this part here might just be covered out, but it basically is it's talking about how money arises through competition in the marketplace. And as Bitcoin maximalists, we believe Bitcoin is the strongest money and that it will outcompete fiat money. So we talk about this process, which we believe in, which is called hyper Bitcoinization. Essentially, it's the process of more and more people realizing that Bitcoin is scarcer and inflate slower than all other types of money. So at first it will be sort of a slower bleed and eventually people will then all be running to get into Bitcoin until until it sort of looks like a hyperinflation but the other way around where other fiat currencies value compared to Bitcoin is dropping dramatically. And that's where you get this concept where people come up with very high estimates for what they believe Bitcoin will be worth in decades or two decades, three decades time, where let's say at, at today's estimates, if the world's wealth is 200 or 250 trillion, and that's if you combine things like stocks and bonds and property and so on, and cash and gold, obviously, if Bitcoin were to take a chunk of that, well, then it might be worth hundreds of thousands or even millions per coin measured in today's purchasing power, obviously. So we believe this will occur through a process. So at first it will be more like a store of value and then it will become a medium of exchange and only at the very end it will become sort of a global unit of account. Although for some people, there are people who do literally use it as a unit of account already. And there are some cases in which you would want to consider that also if you are going to get into the altcoin trading game. So the other key thing here is the, cen the censorship resistance and the decentralization. Nobody controls Bitcoin and that's a good thing. So recently in the Bitcoin uh, history there was a debate and that debate was around whether or not there should be a particular technology implemented and there was a sort of impasse there. What happened is some of the large Bitcoin businesses and supposedly over 90% of the Bitcoin miners wanted to implement the technology a certain way and I'm just simplifying just so you don't have to understand all the technical details of it. But despite that kind of support the actual investors, or what, what we colloquially call the hodlers, didn't actually go along with that plan. And the reason being they didn't believe in the developer who was pushing that change. They didn't believe in the technical approach behind 
doing a segwit and 2x, which was increasing the block size. So this campaign, despite that kind of support, still failed. And that's a lesson to you then, because it shows you that miners don't actually control Bitcoin. They follow the profitability. And in that, that in turn is set by whichever fork of Bitcoin, whichever brand of Bitcoin or whichever type of Bitcoin the investors or the hodlers want to hold. So this is an example of peer-to-peer -peer network governance because those hodlers basically dumped the futures token on some of the exchanges for this 2x coin. And in doing so, the value went to something like 0.15 compared to the original chain, BTC chain of 0.85. And so doing that, that basically torpedoed the 2x fork. And so, as you can see here, this demonstrates that Bitcoin has a commitment to decentralization and scaling the right way. So with the above in mind, let's now look at these shitcoins and see why it's not cryptocurrencies, it's Bitcoin and Bitcoin alone, pretty much. So with this whole debate of blockchain use cases, these are essentially a case of blockchain for the sake of blockchain. Bitcoin was specifically designed to be a digital sound money, otherwise it would not have been designed in such a way where every transaction is validated by every full node. And I think this was proven out if you look at some of the examples where banks and other companies tried to implement other forms of blockchain and ended up finding out that actually, no, you know what, this is not that commercially viable. And in those cases, they ended up using other technologies, just like a standard database technology and so on. And that's fine because they're not trying to be a decentralized sound money. So blockchain was specifically designed to be that thing. So it doesn't really make sense to use it in other forms. Um, another fork that came up in the Bitcoin debate, and this one was, I think, around August 2017, um, so essentially there was a debate and another group basically forked away from Bitcoin and that would have been okay, but they also tried to steal the branding and co-opt the branding of Bitcoin. So they call themselves Bitcoin Cash, but really they should just be called Bcash because they shouldn't really be allowed to take the name. Not from a legal point of view, just from a social enforcement point of view. I don't believe they should be called Bitcoin Cash. So this meme, while it is just quite, you know, it's very funny, I think it actually does explain some of the relevant things in this kind of debate. This debate, the, the Bcash people basically wanted to scale everything on the chain, on layer one. They didn't want to sort of use that idea within Bitcoin where we would scale on a layer above the, the, the layer one. And that's, I think, the more technically sound approach and makes a lot more sense just because that's the same way we scaled the internet. It doesn't make sense for every full node to validate every single transaction. And if we created this, you know, Frankenstein monster where every full, where every node had to be able to validate every transaction, it wouldn't be able to be installed by the average person. The average person would not be able to run a full node. And that in turn would then lead to a form of centralization. And we would not be able to kind of defend the protocol as it is. So the funny thing about this stuff is this meme, I'll just talk through some of the key points here. So with the Virgin altcoiner, you know, this person who thinks that these coins are, are, you know, are needed for daily transactions right now. Well, like I said before, Bitcoin's most important use is for high value transactions. It might be a clash of visions. So the BTC Bitcoin view is really more that Bitcoin will be more like the settlement layer amongst big banks and big, um, you know, uh, large people conducting large value, high value transactions. Small value transactions can be done on layers above that, such as the Lightning Network or through uh, banks with their other kind of mechanisms that retail customers could uh, transfer amongst each other. Um, so, and a few other points here on the Virgin altcoiner. So you got here, they're barely up in USD, but they're massively down in Satoshi's. So 
Sometimes when you're trading around in altcoins, you've got to be careful because actually you want to end up, the aim here is to end up with more BTC. If you don't end up with more BTC, you might not actually be ahead in the long run. Um, and so let me just talk through a couple of the Bitcoiner uh, ways of thinking that actually <laughs> they don't care that much about transactions in the here and now. They, they care about the long run. So they, so they just want more money, right? And they know Bitcoin will only become rarer over more time, you know, and I think the funny thing with this one here is doesn't know how the coins work and doesn't really care. It's pretty funny because it's, it's, I think in some ways that's actually a better way to be because you just focus more on the monetary aspects of it, not so much the specific payment network technology implementation aspect. And that's where a lot of people go wrong. They fall down the wrong rabbit hole and they chase that rabbit hole. And, and the thing is, it's not that they're stupid people. They're highly intelligent people, but people just get misguided and they're not looking at the right things. Uh, so we'll move on. So here, here's just a bit of a meme and a bit of a jab at some of the uh, other hot new cryptocurrency space. You know, you got all these people now. It's almost like a penny stock altcoin casino. You know, all these shit coins and people just slap a white paper together and they just throw all these buzzwords out there and then they say, oh, look, look at all these partnerships we've got. But really, that's not where the value is at. The value is in sound money. Now, just a quick discussion on Ripple. So the problem, some of the problems with Ripple are, firstly, it's not actually decentralized. It's centrally kind of controlled by this company and it's pre-mined something like 60% of the supply is still held in the Ripple company's hands. That's over 60 billion ripples out of the 30 and only like 38.5 billion or something like that are out in circulation as I make this presentation today. So really, you've got to ask yourself, is Ripple decentralized? Is it a sound money? Or is it really just more like a payment network? Uh, yeah, and even the XRP token itself I don't really view that as trying to be a store of value. And yet you've got a lot of people who think who are just kind of speculating on the value of the XRP token. I don't think it's the best investment, but you be the judge. So here are some of the takeaway messages from this talk. Don't think of it as cryptocurrencies. Don't think of it as like, oh, which forks and whatever do I need to hold? Just think Bitcoin, singular. There's one blockchain and the corollary of that is, be wary of the people who don't build on top of Bitcoin. If they're trying to build their own shitcoin, at best, they're misguided. At worst, they're trying to enrich themselves at your cost. Don't focus on the technology. This is about sound money. Focus more on the monetary and economic aspects of this phenomenon. They're much more important for a newbie to understand. So, the other thing is, some of these altcoins, and there's always there's always someone out there trying to sell you something, right? And they'll use different ways to sell it to you. They might say, oh, look, Ripple has a higher on-chain transaction rate per second, or our blockchain size is bigger, or look who we've partnered with. But you've got to refocus it back to what is digitally scarce. Which one is the digitally scarce one? Which one has a proven commitment to decentralization? Which one has a proven commitment to censorship resistance? That is Bitcoin. So, Next steps, obviously you've got to do some research, but I, I would recommend that you run a Bitcoin full node. Um, look after your Bitcoin private key security. So as you start, you might just get a web or phone wallet and that's fine for a small amount. But as your investment grows or if you put more into it, well then now you need to increase your security as well. So that means you need to look into hardware wallets and the next step is even really more deep cold offline storage. So. Examples of a hardware wallet might be a Trezor or a Ledger Nano S. Um, and for, for the more hardcore kind of cold offline storage, well then you want to look into things like uh, Bitcoin Armory, which is a wallet, uh, wallet software which, allow, which allows an offline wallet storage. Or you could look into paper wallets. Um, but I would just point out here that you've got to be really, really careful and make sure that those keys never touch the online world. You want to keep them off offline such that you increase your security and improve the odds that you can hold on to your bitcoins 
Also, make sure you you have backups. There are so I've heard so many stories of friends who have lost Bitcoin from not having a backup of their keys. Uh, and also make sure that those keys are accessible to your loved ones in case anything happened to you. Finally, you've just you've just got to understand the hodl ethos, meaning don't get too taken in by the kind of short-term fluctuations in the news. That Bitcoin is volatile, right? It absolutely is going to be volatile for a very long, you know, for a long time. But it's going to be volatile in the, mostly in the direction upwards, or at least that's the Bitcoin maximalist view. If you, you know, if you could, I mean, obviously it's not possible, but if it were possible to just buy some Bitcoin and fall asleep for five years and wake up, that would be ideal. Because then you wouldn't have had that risk of selling out your coins too early because you panic sold. Or selling out your coins too early because you wanted a gain, but you didn't wait for the really big gain. Right, so a lot of people mention this to me. They say, "Oh, I wish I bought in earlier." And look, don't we all? Right, we all wish we bought in earlier and held on all the way, never sold any coins, and so on and so forth. Right, but here's the reality: if you don't understand this economic case for Bitcoin, if you don't have that kind of resolve about why you're in this game, you'll sell out too early. You might well have bought in at twenty dollars a coin. But then you might have sold at two hundred dollars a coin. You wouldn't have held on for that really big payoff, the hundred, you know, multiple hundred thousand dollar payoff per coin. So that's there. There are a few things that you should focus on. And I've just got a few links here as well in terms of recommended reading. So uh, Jameson Lop's Bitcoin Resources page is fantastic. There's a whole bunch of links on there, and also to kind of understand the economic point of view. I recommend the Nakamoto Institute crash course. There's a whole bunch of articles on there. Some of my favorites from there are speculative attack and hyper Bitcoinization. And uh, yeah, if you've got any feedback for me, hit me up. Um, happy to you know, answer your questions or maybe take that uh, feedback on for what I can cover in the next video. Thanks guys.